Well, welcome tonight. We're going to have uh, our next to the last presentation for the year on the source box at Family Search. And the other day, I started having second thoughts about whether this was really worthy of having a presentation or not. And I ran into somebody who will remain nameless. And this person asked, you know, what the class is going to be on. And I said, the source box. And they said, what's that? And that told me right then and there that this is a topic that we need to, to uh, discuss. And quite honestly, as I look back at my own usage of family search, I can go for ages without ever going into the source box. And so it's probably that way for most of us. You might be surprised what you can do there. And so we're going to learn a little bit about the source box tonight. I'm sure there'll be something new for everybody. Okay, that first picture was a picture of a card catalog because, you know, the source box is a uh, is represented on the screen as a, uh, you know, a web page. It doesn't really physically exist. And so it's hard to picture what it is because it's not really a box like what you see here, but that's what we call it, the source box. And so what we're going to do is discuss this. We're going to talk a little bit about its features, how to find it, and most importantly, how to use it and ways it can help us and benefit us. Okay, Sourcebox has some interesting features. One is it's the place that we store all of the historical records that are turned into sources. This is where they go when we use SourceLinker. They're all taken and dropped into your source box. And it's a place where you can also store sources that you make yourself, meaning those that when you go into a person's source list and you want a new source that you want to make, you go up and click on sources and then you say create a source and you fill in all the boxes yourself. This is where those would go. And then lastly, you can have, I don't know how many, but I know, you can see I have over 10,000 in there. You can have at least 10,000 sources because I do. So I know there's a lot of room in that source box. I would imagine that it'll just hold however many sources you create. And in that source box, you can actually organize things into folders, just like having file folders in your filing cabinet. And you can have up to 200 folders that you can file these sources. And we'll be talking about that tonight. And so, and as you can see, this is where we put all of our sources. Any source you've ever created is gonna to go to the source box. Okay, so where do we find the source box? Well, the, the reasonable way to find it, the way that's logical is to go up on the you know, top of any page where it shows your name after you've signed in and you click on your name and on the drop down you go to source box that's the preferred way to get into it now the other way i know to get into it is to go over on a person's page and click on their sources and then click on add source and then at the bottom where it says attach from source box, you can click there and that will take you over into the source box. But that's really not the preferred way to go because the system is expecting you now to pick a source to attach to this person that you were using to get into the source box in the first place. So really the best way to get in is the first one that I showed you. Okay, so this is what the screen looks like for the source box. And of course, everything I show you is based on a computer view, not the view that you would get from um, an iPhone or tablet or some smaller device. So it may look different if you're using the, the tree app, but we're just using the regular web page view for these presentations. Okay, so this is a source box and there are many parts to it here that make up this source box and help it to function and do the things we want it to do. 
there's a section called home. Think of it as a folder where all the sources that haven't been filed somewhere else can be found. This is the, the uh, default view that you get when you go into the source box. When you open it up, it automatically takes you to the home page or the home group where all the sources that aren't in some other uh, folder are shown. Then there's the all box, and that's where all of them are found, whether they've been filed away somewhere or they're in your home folder, all the sources can be found there. But that, by, interestingly enough, is not the default uh, folder that you see. The default one you see when you first come in is the home one. Then there's a section for my folders. And of course, if you've never created one, you won't have any there. You can have up to 200. We'll talk a little bit about what you could make these folders for in a little bit. You'll see where it shows home right now. It's showing the name of the folder that we're in. And so we're in the home folder, so it'll say home up there. If I had clicked on Barney and Baloo, like is down here in my folders, then it would say Barney Baloo here. Then there's a, a box for searching. It will search only the title of sources. It won't search anything else in the sources other than their titles. There's also a filter that will describe talk about a little bit later. And there's also some functions. You have a chance to create a source, to move a source and remove a source. And those I think are fairly explanatory. We'll show you how you move sources in a little bit. And then lastly, you see the attach button. So that if I wanna take this US find a grave source, and attach it to somebody, what I do is click the little attach button, and then I have to tell the system who to attach it to. But it allows me to take a source out of the source box and put it on a person. And so those are there for every source. Okay, so now, this, where are we gonna put these sources? You know, the problem is that they're all disorganized if we just use that home folder. Now, if you've only done 25, 50 sources, hey, it's no big deal. Once you start building up a long list of sources, that matter unorganized becomes a real headache when you're trying to find a specific source. And you really need to do something to kind of organize because your home folder can become quite large and be quite unwieldy. And so the solution is to have some new folders. And so if you don't have any folders, you can create some for my folders by clicking on new folder. A little box pops up, you give that folder a name and it will stick it over there under my folders and alphabetize it by the first, first word, the first letter of the first word. And you'll be able to have up to 200 folders there. Okay, and if you want to get rid of a folder, click on the three dots and you'll be able to either rename it or just delete it. And that only deletes the folder. It doesn't delete anything that's in it. We can talk about that in just a minute. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about these folders. Why are you creating them? You're trying to create them so that you can store your sources in some logical manner so that if you need to find a source, you can actually locate it without going through hundreds and hundreds of sources. Okay, and so you can decide how you want to do that. I I've gave some suggestions here. You could make folders for types of records. You could have birth sources, marriage sources, death sources, will sources, land sources, or you could have them by location. You could pick like countries or states or even counties or cities. 
and file the sources away by where they came from. Or another way is to have one for individual ancestors of yours by their name or maybe just by surnames. And that's the one I've done for most, even though I have kind of a hybrid that has a little bit of all of this, most of my folders are surname folders. And so if I have a, a source for my Sands family, it goes in the Sands folder. If it's for my Hale family, it goes in the Hale folder. And then I only have to look through that folder to find the person I'm looking for. Okay, now sources can only go in one folder. They can be in that home folder or it can be in one of your folders, but you can't put it in two or three or four different folders. That source can only go in one folder. And if you delete that folder, the sources just go back to the home folder. They don't get deleted. So you don't have to worry. There's a bunch of sources in a folder that you want to get rid of. It's just that they'll go back and become matter unorganized. They'll just go back into the home folder. And your all sources is your go-to place if you just can't seem to find the, the source any other way because the all sources should have everything that's in your source box. Now, moving these sources around physically, you've made folders, but how do we get the sources in there is the basic question. Well, there's two ways to do it. One is to do drag and drop. Just put your mouse on top of one of the sources, press the left mouse key, hold it down, drag the source over to the folder you want to put it in, and then just let go and drop it in there. That works good, but sometimes it ends up getting dropped in the wrong folder and you don't notice. So it can be a little bit tricky. <coughs> Actually, the easier way is to just choose the source or multiple sources and check them like you see here where I've checked all four and they've turned into little blue boxes and then just click the word move up here. And when you do that, it's going to show you a list of all your folders. You just pick the folder you want, you click on it, and they all get put in that folder. So that makes it very easy to move sources around. Either way works, whatever you're more con you know, convenient to you, whatever is easier for you to do. Now, like I said before, there is a filtering system that's in place to kind of help you because if you're working in that home folder and you have an awful lot of sources, it's hard sometimes to find things, but we can reduce the size of the group of records that we're looking at, sources that we're looking at by using the filters. By clicking filter, you get this pop-up. Now, right now it is set to show all types of all the three types of sources. So every possible source I have in my my um, source box will show in the list right now. Everything that's in the home folder is going to show because there's three types of sources: family search sources, user created, and memory sources. And right now they're all showing. Now, if I wanted to only see the sources that were created using Source Linker, putting family search records as sources on people, I could unclick these other two and just leave family search clicked and it would show me just the family search sources. Or if I wanted to just see the sources I had made from a memory, I could just unclick the first two, leave memory clicked, and I would see just memory sources. So that's a way to reduce the size of the, the group of sources that we're looking at dramatically. Now, we can also do the same thing with dates. We can, right now we're showing all sources regardless of whether they have dates or not. I could reduce it just to the sources that have no date selected for the source. 
that'd be a good tool if I wanted to make sure I added the dates to my sources. I could just come to my source box and you know click on sources with no dates and I'd know exactly which sources I needed to edit and add the date to. But if I'm looking for sources from a certain time period, I could click date range, give a beginning and ending year, and they will give me all the sources that show a date between the two years that I put there in the list. So there are several ways you can use filters to reduce the total number of sources that you're looking at. Now, the other option is to do a title search, but it does exactly what it says. It only searches the title. It won't search all the other stuff inside the source. It's only going to look at the title of the source. So I did a search for Richard Carter and it brought up brought up more than two, but I'm just showing you the first two sources that have the name Richard Carter in them. And so this gives me a chance to really narrow down if I have put names of people in there. Now I could have put a location, I could have put Scarsboro and it would have gone through and filled out all the Scarborough references that I had in titles. Remember, it's only as good as the records, the names you've given these sources. Now, this really helps you if, you have, if, if you're trying to narrow things down. You do have to be careful when you have a large database like I have, it takes a little time to do this. It doesn't just pop up instantaneously. It took maybe a half a minute to go through all my sources looking for Richard Carter. The other thing is that 1799 at the beginning of this first one really isn't the title. That's the date that was given for that source, but it is treated as the title. So if you have a certain date that you're looking for, like you know it's a person's death record, and you put their death year on there, you could search for that year. And if that was the year you put in the date, it'll come up. I could have searched for 1799 and it would have come up. It's also over here in the title too. Okay, so there's several ways to reduce the number of people that you're, or number of sources that you're actually gonna have to look at when you're trying to find something. Okay, now understand what we're doing is we're attaching these sources to people. And there's a couple of ways to do that when you're in family search. We can go to the person page and we can click on a hint and that'll give us the, the source tracker and we can fill all that out and it'll create a source and put it on the person and put that source over in our, our uh, source box. Or we can go over to records, we can go on the same page and go down the column below research help, click on family search, go into records and find a record that appears to be this person. And then click source it, create the source and it does the same thing. The other way to get a source on a person is if you've already made the source in the past and you know it's in your source box, to go to your source box, find that source, that's where the, the kicker is. You've got to be able to find it and then click attach, whoops. And when you click attach, it'll put you, it'll ask you, who do you want to attach it to? And you can either provide them by searching for by the name or the preferable way is to have their ID number copied. Just go over and click on the ID number and then click on copy ID and then just provide it. Or you can even go to your recent list and find the person there. But one way or the other, provide them with the name of the person that you want to attach the record to and it will attach. Because remember, what's our goal in Family Search? It's to put every record, make every record into a source and have that source attached to at least one person. And some sources can be attached to many people because many people are named in them. Okay, 
let's talk a little bit about the three types of sources. There's the family search source, the user created source, and the memory source. They're all a little different, they're created differently, and they can be edited differently too. So we need to kind of look at each one. So a family search source is one that has the little tree. You'll see it up here on this one that's on the left-hand side. There's that little tree up there. That tells you this came from family search. It started as a record and we use the um, record, um, source tracker to go and turn that record into a source. Now, some interesting things about those record, those sources that were made in family search from records. You can't edit everything in it if you click edit. You cannot edit the link and you cannot edit the citation. They're grayed out. The only things you can actually edit will be the date, the title, and you probably should edit the title and put the person's name in there. And you can edit the notes, which are often blank. I like to take the transcription and do a copy and paste of the transcription into the notes. Then when somebody comes along so that they don't actually have to go to that source, they can just look at the the uh, parts of the source that I created and see what they're going to find if they go to the source, what was in the transcription. And then of course, you can always edit, you know, the changes you made and tell them why you did it. So the, the sources made from family search are not totally capable of being edited. Okay, and that notes field is probably the single most important part of this other than the actual link because that note area allows you to put all the details about the source there so that people can see what's going on with the source. Okay, user created sources. These are a couple of different kinds of things. If they're truly created by you, the user, where you went to sources on a person, and then clicked on create a source and, and said, you know, I wanna make it myself. Well, then you'll be going through filling in all the boxes. But we have a lot of, man, of uh, electronic automated ways to create sources that are considered user created. I can use my roots magic and transfer a source over into family search. And it doesn't always take everything over. I can go in Ancestry into my tree in Ancestry and copy a source over and it really doesn't bring much over as we'll see. Or we could use uh, uh, RecordSeq and create a source anywhere on the web and then add this into Family Search, and it does a little better job but still needs some touching up. So the automated processes, none of them are perfect. And they all lead some to some problems. And this, this is probably the worst example. This is what happens when you bring a source over from Ancestry. And this is all you get. You're going to see that it has a title and it has the link. Now, at least they have the link, even though they don't tell us the citation, they don't have any notes. Uh, you can click on the link to see what this record was. It'll take you to the transcription page. The only problem is if the user and family search does not have an ancestry account, they're not going to get to see anything. And so this will be a totally worthless source to them when it looks like this. What really needs to be done with these sources that we bring over from ancestry is we need to fill them in. And you can see all the work that I had to do for this particular source. So I had to go in and find the date. It's a marriage record, fill in the date. I added the husband and the wife to the title so that I know who it's about. The link is okay the way it was. And I had to go find the citation over at Ancestry and they're making that more difficult to find. 
And then I did a copy and paste of the transcription for this record. You can only see four lines of it. There's more to it than that. But I did put that in there so that if somebody comes along that doesn't have an ancestry account, they can see what was transcribed. And then I marked it that I updated the source to make it complete. So see, sometimes doing these user created sources when you're doing an automated source, sometimes it can be more work than just creating the source from scratch all by yourself, if you wanna do it right. Okay, now the memory sources, they're actually created by you too. They're cool. You can actually take a memory and turn it into a source, or you can start creating a source and then upload an image to memories of that source. And you'll have what they call a memory source. It'll have this little box with the two little peaks in it representing memories and the memory source will look a little something like this and you're going to be able to add the date to it you can uh, set up the title however you want it will show you because you've clicked on add a memory it's going to show you a thumbnail of the actual memory you should add a citation where this came from. So in this case, I gave him the film number and the items and the title for the source that it was from the uh, Evangelical Church's parish records. And then we did a English translation of what it says there since it's in German and many people wouldn't be able to read it. So if they click on this, they'll be able to know exactly what's going on here. Those are real nice sources. They're really created by you. They take some work, but they're cool. Remember to fill in all the boxes as, most, as much as you can. Fill in everything that you can. And then remember, absolutely make sure this gets saved to your source box because people can just detach sources. If they detach the source, you may never realize it's even gone, or once you realize it's gone, you may have a devil of a time finding it to reattach it. So make sure you've got it over in your source box. Now, there's one thing about the source box I haven't mentioned. I'm sure some of you have been wondering if this was gonna come up or not. This is about saving sources into the source box. When you're in Source Linker, you're going to see as you're doing your sourcing and you're connecting the people up, you're going to see over on the left hand side the tag boxes that are tagged. And you're going to see the little link there that says add source to source box. And right now it's, it's checked. You don't have to check it. If you uncheck it, the source won't go in your source box. And some people don't want to clutter their source box up with, let's say, the sources that come from family search sources. Because, you know, if they detach it, it'll probably show up again as a hint. And we can just go back and reattach it, or I can do a search for the person and records, and it'll be right there at the top of the list. It'll be easy to find. And there, there's a temptation to uncheck that. Okay, if you leave it checked, it's the easiest way to get records into your source box. It's wonderful, but there's something you got to remember. If you uncheck that, it remains unchecked forever. And if I stop sharing to my source box today and I don't change it back tomorrow, it's still not gonna to save to the source box. Next month, it still won't be saving to the source box. I've got to remember to go back in there and recheck it because it doesn't revert back to saving to the source box. It stays with whatever you want it to be. So be very cautious about that. That's something that, uh, I get into trouble myself at times with. Okay, tagging. 
that's another thing that seems very insignificant and you know why is it even there what's the value to it this is the real one of the real powerful things about sources when you're doing family search sources it usually kind of gives you suggestions for what to tag to begin with and they get tagged if you're creating your own you have to go in there notice you can't tag marriages that's one thing that doesn't get tagged ever you just have to go put the source over on the marriage to have it associated to the marriage but you can tag the the um, vitals to a source the person's name their sex birth christening death and burial so this top example is a death record and it's from an obituary so it gives the person's name their sex birth and death information might have burial but i don't know i want to check those why because i want this source to be associated with those vital records so on the bottom i have my dad's birth information okay he was born the 30th of october 1908 in globe gila county arizona should be arizona territory wasn't even a state yet now how do i know that's accurate because of his gazillion sources that we have on him there are 17 sources that show his birth information and they're all listed here you see the first seven and so i this is very very powerful how do i know this information is accurate because i've got all these sources that say so this is probably the most powerful thing in family search so you want to make sure that your sources are properly tagged you just go up to the source if it says tag and it says zero edit click edit i don't even think you have to do edit just click tag and then tag the things that you find on that source and they will automatically go on the different vitals that you checked this is really a powerful, powerful, powerful tool. Okay, just remember, if you see zero tagged, you definitely wanna go in and tag. And you can tag other people's sources and they can tag your sources if you forgot. Okay, but try to be consistent and that's gonna help us with the vitals. Okay, now that date on sources. If you haven't noticed, if you don't put a date on the sources, the system can't sort your sources chronologically. And that's the default when you go to a person's sources. They want the sources to be chronological. If you don't have a date showing, it goes to the bottom of the list. So you want to go in and put the date in, either just the year, or day, month, year, if you have it, and then standardize it, just like any other date, and then it'll go up and be put in order. Now, why do we do this? It helps you to identify the source, it allows the chronological sorting. But what date? Sometimes this will be a little tricky. Normally it's the date that's on the source, but now let's say you're doing a book you're sourcing a book. You ought to source the date of publication of the book. Yes, that's going to bring the source way down to the bottom, but in all honesty, that's when that book was created. Okay, if you're doing like find a grave or other death records, you would want to choose the death date, not the birth date, because the birth date's a secondary source and the, the death date in this case is the primary source. So, you know, pick this date that's the most representative of that source and add it to it. It's real easy. Just go up, it'll say date, click on date. It'll open up the edit screen and let you put it in. Okay, one last thing and we're done books 
many of us have books that we would love to get sourced into family search. There's an issue here though. If we make a source for a book and we don't, if we don't put any notes on it, it'll be just fine to use over and over and over again. It'll be kind of worthless. It'll tell people that, yeah, this person's in that book, but you won't know where. You won't know what the book says, but you could put a hundred people, different people and tag it to that source. What we tend to like to do though, is we wanna make a source for the book. And then we wanna say in the notes for person A, person A is found on page 26. And this is what it says about that person. So we save it and that's great. And then later on, we come to another person in the book that's maybe person B and they're over on page 145. So we pull up person A's source because it's that same book. And we just edit the information down in the notes, figuring, well, that, that's okay because I'm creating a new version of this and then save it. The problem is once I edit that note, it changes it for every time that note is used. So to have a real specific note telling us this person has this information in the book, that person has this information in the book, we're gonna need different sources. And we don't wanna make the source from scratch. So what's the option? The option is to create what's called a master source. Now that's a source that we're going to use to create duplicates. We're not actually ever going to use this source in family search on a person. We're gonna use it to create copies. As a master source will have just this and it. it's gonna have the date of publication. It's gonna have the title of the book. It's going to have a link if there's a link to the book and the citation for the book and the notes are gonna be blank. And then I make a folder called book master sources. And so here's an example of one. And it's the descent of Dietrich Mummert of early York, Pennsylvania. Here's another one down here. George Bortner of Cadoras Township, York County, Pennsylvania and his descendants. Okay, those are master sources. Those are books that I have hundreds of families that I wanna source to those books. So how am I gonna do that? I have a master source now in my master source folder. So if I wanna create a source to really use now on let's say a Mummert family, I'm gonna go to my master sources folder and I'm gonna click on a source. And then when I click on it, I'm going to click on copy. And it's gonna make a copy of this original. It's gonna, not gonna touch that original source up there. That's my master source. It's just gonna create a source that I can work with. And it'll look kind of like this. So now there's a couple of things I need to do with it and it'll be ready to attach to people, okay? And this is what I'll need to do. I'll need to edit the title and get rid of that copy of quotation marks, master source copy. Get that out of there so the title's good. I've already got a date for it. I've got the title of the book. I got the link to family search where the book is found. I've got the citation for it. It's a book I made, I wrote. And then all I have to do is add notes. So I'm saying for the person I'm doing right now, which is Dietrich Mummert in the book, Descent of Dietrich Mummert. This is the guy the book's about. On pages one and two is found this information and I copied and pasted from the book the whole stack of source information on Dietrich and his list of his children and his wife's information. Pasted that all in there. And now I'm ready to save it and attach it to Dietrich and everybody in his family. And I haven't messed up my master. 
Now, when I go to his son, William, I can go make a copy of the master again, do the little bit of editing, add the notes on William and source it to all of William's family. This is a real cool way to save you time if you have a book and you're trying to source multiple instances in that book. Okay, and it makes it very easy. Now, the one catch is since these master sources are in that, that uh, folder for master sources, that's where this new one that I made, this one here that I created on the screen is first located. So I'm gonna to have to take that source and move it by clicking on it and then clicking move and go move it where I wanna move it. And in my case, since I have folders by surname, I'd move this source over to the Mummert folder. Leave the master in the master folder, take the real source and move it to the Mummert folder. Okay, that's sources. I hope there's something here that you learned. I wouldn't be surprised if we all didn't learn something because I learned some things by trying to create this. Do we have any questions?